welcome everyone to another broadcast of the Soul of the Everyman on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are podcasts. You can find them at artistfirst.com. We welcome your questions and comments by email at dj at artistfirst.com. And here they are, Michael and Margaret Lyons. <laughs> Thank you very much, C-Man. And I am Michael Lyons. And I'm Margaret. She's Margaret. And who's listening to these thoughts? <laughs> Pretty much nobody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the question, our question for tonight, Margaret, is who's listening to your thoughts? Mm. Indeed, who is? Who is? And, um, you know, it came, it, this, this is one that came to me which is because uh-huh. nothing ever comes to me. <laughs> now stop that. True, I, I, I am reclaimed most of the time. But this one came to me um, while driving, I think, somewhere or other. I don't remember. It came to me that, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll phrase it in this way. All of us are very familiar with the kind of the, your own internal voice, the voice in your head, the, the you that speaks to you. And um, we all hear ourselves kind of enunciating full sentences, words, thoughts, all kinds of things, commentary, um, in, in, within our head. There is no audio here. If someone's looking at you, you just kind of look constipated. <laughs> you're just thinking. And, and you're, you're not just, you're not thinking in the way, if you can describe this as thinking, that a computer thinks. It, it isn't just a bunch of processes running along um, like a machine. There is, an, there is a true sense of an entity which you call yourself talking, you know, speaking in English sentences, um, all kinds of things, you know, commentary on the drivers that are around you commentary on what you're going to do that day, commentary on what happened yesterday, da, 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 goes on and on, right? And yet, there you are, you know, completely um, silent from all observers. No one can tell what you're saying to yourself inside your head. And what came to me was, who's listening? Mm-hmm. You know, who's listening? Because you are speaking a thought enunciates itself. It, it literally says, here I am, I'm a thought, I'm going to talk about this. It stands up at the podium, calls for your attention, your attention, and speaks. And what came to me was that a thought, all thoughts do, is speak. They, they are sources, not sinks. Thoughts don't Listen, you can't talk to a thought, but yet the thought talks to you all the time, sometimes constantly. Sometimes it's a cacophony in there that no one else can hear. No one else can hear this. In fact, a lot of the trouble in the world, Margaret, comes because people believe that people understand what they're thinking about. Well, yes, yeah, they do. <laughs> they really think that everyone knows what I'm thinking about, right? No. But the thing is, who, uh, you could say who, who, who's talking, but the better question I thought was, who's listening? <laughs> if you want to get yourself really tied in a knot. Right, because, because the thought which just speaks can't listen. Thoughts don't um, take information. They just spout it off, usually in response to some sort of stimulus, you know. Look how tall, short, fat, whatever, so-and-so is. Or look at that guy driving, he's a crazy man, or whatever. But it's all the thought, da 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 you know, and, and sometimes it's two and three of them all speaking at once. But they demand one thing, actually two things. They demand an audience. They demand something to pay attention to them. Thoughts will literally wake you up in the middle of the night. Well, who are they waking up? Obviously, the thought, the thought is not the audience. It's true. Thoughts, I say, oh, my, I couldn't go to sleep. My thoughts kept me up all night. Well, what? Well, who are they talking to? 
if it's a machine, the machine doesn't keep itself up all night. There's a machine lacks one thing. It lacks a consciousness. It lacks an awareness. It lacks the ability to listen to itself. Because the, the basic um, characteristic of consciousness is that it is quiet. That it listens. That it doesn't think. Or rather, it doesn't speak in that quite that way. It doesn't pop off and say, hey, Guess what we're going to do next week? Woohoo! <laughs> That's a thought. Or you have emotion, you have emotions and thoughts. But, but who is listening? Who is it that they're trying to grab the attention of? And when you look at it that way, you realize that there are different aspects to you. Because you're looking at it in terms of, wait a minute, if I have this thought, why is it so loud? Why? Because the thought's there already. Why is it so loud? And then this other thought comes in and says, okay, where did that come from? So where do your thoughts come from? If it's not you who's the person that they're actually trying to get the attention of. Well, it's nice. The language informs, because what you said was, I had this thought. Mm-hmm. So, so there's at least um, two things there. There's I, and then you say as an object, had this thought. So the, so the thought, all spouty nonsense of it, all, 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 all chattery chatterbot of it, is, is more of an object to the consciousness. And I think that's the proper way <laughs> to think about it. <laughs> right, your thoughts are forms. Forms. They're forms. They're not being states. They're forms. Very talkative forms. <laughs> well, their nature is talkative. But I'm going to go back a little bit to where are these thoughts coming from? Mm. Okay, and and you really, you think it's you, but they're trying to get your attention so that it is you. It's only you if you engage in the thought. And I find that fascinating. Well, fascinating in... I would say because because you can choose not to, mm-hmm. and if the thought if the thought was you, you can't choose not to engage because it's you. Correct. You're you're kind of always intimately engaged with yourself. Well, who was it that said, "Wherever you you go, <laughs> there you are"? <laughs> That's one of my favorite phrases. I say that. I say that. Very frequently to people. I so said, wherever you go, there you are. And I just look at you. So you but go, now you understand what it means. Okay. Yeah. And most people do that. They just look at you like, what the heck are you talking about? Because they they hadn't observed the back and forth that actually happens. Because the thought's there and it's it's vying for your attention. It wants to engage. And we usually just engage in it. Well, there's something wanting my attention. You almost treat it like a small child. But the truth of the matter is um, it isn't separate necessarily from you. But it is a form. It is a different state. It's not a state of being but it is a state of doing. You are thinking. Right. And if you can realize that there are these two states um, that exist within you, the state of being and the state of doing, it kind of straightens things out because you, you don't confuse who you are with who you think you are. Yes, I like what you said also, you know, it's very, um, it's a great analogy to say,
I have to treat your thoughts as though they were a bunch of children or were just a bunch of other, um, just call them entity forms, but they want, they really want your attention as, yes. chi- as children do. They demand. Uh, your, your thoughts can get um, needy. <laughs> They, they really want <laughs> to funny. be heard. Yes, they want to be heard. Just the thought of them, the thought of the thought being so needy. <laughs> it's but but funny. they are. Th- thought, <laughs> they are. It's funny because thoughts are needy. Thoughts, um, not just they. They just aren't informative. They don't just come up and say, you know, we've got that appointment next week, and you should probably keep an eye on that and just go away. Like a let's say a computer would pop up a little window and say, hey, you know, I have an appointment next week, and you're like, okay, great. But the thought doesn't just want to inform it says as you say it wants to engage and why and and this is a key portion of why thoughts engage thoughts have a survival instinct thoughts want your energy as a mechanism for uh, their own survival and growth thoughts need you not the other way around they're they're needy and they require your attention as their food. Like children require your attention to feed them and to, 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 to engage with them because they need that for their own development. Well, thoughts, like children, um, grow. If you, if you continue, like what's obsession, right? Obsession is, is paying attention to a set of thoughts or a thought and, and so that it grows larger and larger and larger and seems to be the whole world. Your whole world becomes the set of thoughts. And people say, well, this, this guy is obsessed. In one way you are, your being is being consumed in one way by all these needy, parasitic, in this case toxic, and, and in, in many ways um, uh, damaging you know, neurologically and psychologically damaging to have that much uh, thought parasitism on you. Well, thought is a form and it doesn't exist without giving it attention. And and that's something that you know intuitively. Mm. I'm not thinking about that. I don't want to feed it. We've heard that. Yeah, and you you know at a very basic level that this is what you do, and to dwell on a thought begins to materialize a certain frequency or pattern around you, and that's what you need to look at. To realize what is it that I've been bringing to me at this point? Is it peace? Is it strife? Is it beauty? Is it joy? Or is it worry? And and each one of those encapsulated in, into a into a thought or a set of thoughts. Mm-hmm. Um. But again, this is, it, it, it's, it's interesting when you start to pick this apart, how language informs. You said, what is it that my thoughts are bringing to me? Again, who's the, who's the you? Who's the me in that sentence? Obviously, the thoughts are, 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 are with you. They're within you. But that's another way of thinking about it. They're within you. In other words, the thoughts... When uh, a nice way of thinking about something is, is if something contains something else, therefore the thing that contains it has got to be bigger, right? It's, you know, you can't put a gallon of milk in a half-gallon jar. So your thoughts are pieces of you, very vocal, needy, sometimes obsessive, sometimes calling things, you know. But they're, they're forms which exist within you. You are not your thoughts. You are far greater. But even, even if you don't know that you're far greater, you're obviously greater because the thoughts are inside you. If they were outside of you, first of all, 
no one would hang out with you because you, your head would be talking all the time. And it would really be <laughs> creepy. <laughs> you know, mm. oh, my, oh, my God. You know, I mean, there's been several uh, great comedies where everyone can hear everyone else's thoughts, right? But, but that would, that's what it would be. It would be like somebody having little speakers on the side of their head and it'd be broadcasting all the time. But inside you, these speakers, these forms, are broadcasting all the time. And to the extent that, as Margaret just said, that you feed them, that you pay attention to them, they, they seem to get bigger and, and, and louder and, and take up more and more room inside you, still inside you. But, but thoughts try to um, tell you, in essence, that they are you. Yes, they want, they want to drive. They want to drive the the you that you've put together. They want to be the consciousness behind the eyes. And it's it's kind of fascinating, really, when you think of it, because when you're experiencing something, um, you are in a direct flow of interacting with the energy of life around you. Mm. But if you think about it, you've narrowed your window of experience to just thinking about it as opposed to taking in um, everything around you, the sensory um, tones, your energy reaching out. Is there a sympathico energy coming from someone else that you're speaking with? Or is it just words that are coming out of a person's mouth? Uh, it's it's much more broad and deep when one one experiences life. Mm. And the interesting thing is that if you're thinking, just strictly thinking about this that's going on in the moment, you really cannot recall what's actually going on around you because you've shut down all those other sensory uh, feeders to you. And you're just thinking about, and thinking about, well, it should happen this way. Did it happen that way? Instead of, well, it, this is actually how it happened. What I do find fascinating is that if you tell that part of you, that logical part that wants to talk about stuff, to record what's actually going on. It does so in such a way that it brings up all aspects of what's going on in that moment. You can recall that way and recall clearly without having a distraction of something saying, well, check it again, check it again. It's supposed to be this way. It's supposed to be this way. Mm -hmm. Instead of, this is the experience, record this. You know, this is the time it happened. This is the temperature of the room when it happened. This is what I was standing on when it happened. This is what I saw when it happened. This is what I heard when it happened. Mm -hmm. it, it's fascinating because it will give you that th sort of 360 uh, recall experience. Well, yeah, um, it's interesting, again, because if you think about the, if you're experiencing something through your thoughts, thoughts will narrow the experience down to what can be talked about, what can be evaluated, liked or disliked, and it, it becomes a series of snapshots, which can also drag you out of the moment, drags you into the past. Oh, this is just like what we went back last year. And, oh, I would love to do that, but I can't afford it, and I can't. So you drink, it drags you to the future. It drags you to the past. It drags you out of the now. Right. And I think when you, told, when you tell your, your mind, which the thoughts love the mind, because the mind is a very um, useful tool. But if you tell your mind record don't don't speak <laughs> shut up and just record then it becomes part of the experience and in essence does its real primal function which is to uh organize and and um bring in 
a great deal of the experience, not the whole experience still, but a great deal of the experience and put it into um, a, you know, that, that, that whole idea we had of the, um, of the experience bank. The, the mind is very good at bringing those experiences in and allowing you to then go and recall them, both from the point of view of, yes, this happened and this is what was happening if you have a moment to do that, it's reflection. It's not obsession. It's not, not a thought talking about it. And, and in that way, the mind uh, is working in harmony with the consciousness. The consciousness is still greater than the mind, but it has, you, you've given the mind its prim- primary function, its task. Record this. Remember this. Help us me, you, experience it all and take it in. And if you give the mind, as you said, that task, it shuts up. It doesn't talk about it because it's too busy doing, oh, 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 I gotta. Yeah. And it's exactly what you want because in, then the moment becomes out of time, time left. It becomes something um, which you can recall with almost crystalline clarity. Whatever you want to, many, many years later perhaps, and yet it, it's not, it isn't fraught with, I liked it, I didn't like it, this was terrible, that was terrible, this reminded me of this, reminded me of that, which is what, the, if you let the thoughts talk about it, then all you hear is the cacophony, the emotion, the, the, the likes and the dislikes. That's not a, a memory experience, it, it's torture. It's a torturous, <laughs> it's a torturous, right? It, 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 it takes you through it and says, oh, and this one was doing that, and that one was doing this, and I felt this way, and I did, so it was terrible, da da it's such it's torture. If, you, if instead you open yourself, accept the moment, put the mind on record, take a breath and just bring it all in. Here I am, wherever you go. There you are. And you're there. And then years later you might go, ah, oh, you know, I remember that so clearly. The, the color of the sun, the sound of the birds, the way, you know, light hit everything, how I felt, the people that, would, that I was with, whatever thoughts perhaps came in, but they aren't, they aren't what the primary motion, you know, mover back there. They're just a piece. Right. It is recorded as a part of um, what was unfolding in that moment. But your, if your mind is allowed to do that and record... Your consciousness then can just absolutely be present, open up, and take in everything that there is. And the mind has to keep up with it in order to record it, which is interesting because sometimes the mind it has trouble with what the consciousness is actually taking in. Um, That's a good point. You know, the mind has to keep up at that point, and it doesn't have time to talk about it. <laughs> Well, <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's not. Because it, when you're in analysis, and that's basically what you were talking about, people have a tendency, they want to an- analyze it right in that moment. And you can't. You're either experiencing something or you are not. People think you can have the experience and talk about it at the same time. And that's not true. Just simply not true. It, it reminds me of people who, when they go to a beautiful place and all they do is take out their phone or their camera and spend the whole time looking through that lens, this tiny little shutter and lens, and not experiencing it. And and sure, you can look back and say, oh, look, oh, oh, oh. you know, but you're not getting, all you're getting is this tiny little postage stamp, piece of film, maybe it jogs a, a slight memory or whatever, yet you put the mind on record, you get the whole thing back in full sensory, uh, experiential reality almost. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, it's not reality, but it's, it's really, really good. Well, you have to train yourself to do that. Yes. Okay, because you can't... Some people think, okay, well, I'll remember this and, I'll rem- and they'll make a list <laughs> of things that they're going to remember then. And you're like, okay, that's not how you do it because you're not going to be able to keep up with me be in record and that's an interesting concept 
because what that means is you have become the the one that takes what the input is and putting it into forms that it can then remember. Store and remember. Right. But, I mean, it's a spatial thing. Yeah. Yes. It's, not, it's not a linear thing. It's a multidimensional record. Like a hologram. Right. You are forming a hologram in your mind of the experience. Isn't that a fascinating thought? Mm. Well, and the this is, yes, you have to train, but I think that people, that everyone is born with this, and if you look at two-year-olds experiencing things, it's in, a, it's, in a, it's in that gestalt kind of way. They're in that moment. And everything that is being experienced at that moment is, is being taken in. Now, they're not trained to it. And maybe they can't put that into a, into a, a, a mode, if you will. But I think that the, the living in the moment part of it is they, something we're all born with. They live in the moment. But the mind is a tool and you have to train... Yes. yourself to use the tool okay so they don't remember a lot from their youth okay because that's not part of uh the utilization of the mind itself they are still trying to figure it all out um well, I, i'm with you there i i think that's correct but some people have explored that and said that the two, that, that those memories are accessible sometimes through hypnosis or whatever but they're nonverbal because the because the ego hasn't started to talk about everything yet. So they, I think it's there, untrained in the untrained capacity of the being. It is there. Well, I can see where it's nonverbal. Frankly, there's memories that you don't need to, to verbalize right. uh, in order to remember. No. See, this yeah. is what I mean by when you tell the mind to remember, it remembers in a wholeness that bypasses uh, the mental aspect of wanting to verbalize everything. That's a very narrow um, corridor or, or access point. Uh, well, I think, and this I think is, uh, you know, experientially I've heard you, this from you, is that there are other avenues into that recording and the pre-verbal mind, even pre-born mind, can remember some of those states, they wouldn't even be things it can express or even access directly. But those are some of the things that tie you to sound, tie you to smells when you're, when you're very uh, certain touches, certain things that, that evoke deep responses, uh, especially when you're talking about getting down into the basic, um, you know, food or, or warmth or sound, things that well, are nonverbal, get into that that experiential memory. The pre-born state, sound, mm. hearing, mm. is usually the primary. Yes. The because, heartbeat, that heartbeat sound, which is with everybody. Right. You don't, your eyes are not open, you're not seeing, and you're, the rest of it, your senses aren't engaged until you're out of the womb. Mm. But hearing, you can hear. And some of them are engaged. Well, let's let's take this back to the studio. And we'll disengage here. Remember, you're not your thoughts, but think about all this. And when we come back, we'll talk more about what you really are. Rick Rodan fans, love mythology with plenty of action and humour? Destroyer's Blood is for you. The new fantasy novel by award-winning author Michael Lines is book one of the adventures of Dev Kalian, the Blood series. Follow Dev and his magic sword betrayer as they are suddenly attacked and forced to return to Olympus to fight in a war they want no part in. The world of men and gods is about to be destroyed by Zeus's ancient foe, 
and only Dev and Trey can stop him. The conflict never stops, and the amazing twist will have you on the edge of your seat. Act now while the ebook is on sale for only 99 cents. Destroyer's Blood is available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, Kobo, and fine e-tailers everywhere. And while you're there, get the free prequel, It's In The Blood, available for a limited time. There is a Reaper is the story of five-year-old Christopher Aaron and his life-changing struggle with leukemia. Winner of both the Indie Bragg Medallion as well as the reader's favorite silver medal for memoir, There is a Reaper has more than 100 Amazon book reviews and a five-star rating. It has been described as life-changing, spiritual, a must-read. Just released on Audible and iTunes, this memoir is also available in paperback and on Amazon Kindle for only 99 cents. Get your copy of this life-changing memoir today. Moonstones and Murder Real murderers need a heart of stone. Meet Maggie and Mike Hearthstone. Parents of twin boys, entrepreneurs, and now empty nesters. Mike is retired, not by choice, from his position as chief of police in the picturesque resort town of Hamilton. And now his wife Maggie and her shop, The Cozy Crystal, are their only source of income. When a mysterious killing interrupts Hamilton's famous Springfield Park rock show, the townsfolk, the Cozy Crystal, and their lives are rocked to the core. Can Mike and Maggie figure out who is behind the murderous deeds before the town comes crashing down around them? A touch of romance, a little mayhem, and a whole lot of suspense, along with plenty of comedy and thrills galore. Get your crystal magnifying glass out. It's time for some Moonstones and Murder. Available on Amazon, Apple, Kobo, and other fine e-tailers in ebook and paperback. Out soon on Audible. Get your copy today. The Fat Man Gets Out of Bed is the latest book from Michael Lines, the award-winning author of There is a Reaper. Featuring 13 original stories, this wide-ranging collection has everything. Forbidden love, gods versus demigods, weird invading aliens, sexy seductive artificial intelligence, and unusual passion between the living and the dead. All set amidst fantastic worlds of pain and loss and boundless joy. From the sublime to the macabre to the bittersweet, The Fat Man Gets Out of Bed will leave you breathless with laughter, brimming with tears, trembling with suspense. Available now on Amazon.com, Google Play, iTunes, Kobo, and fine e-tailers everywhere. The wait is over. First Blood, book two of the Blood series is out. Your favorite bad boy thief, Dev, is back. And the beautiful and deadly Trey is right there with him. She is sharp, sexy, and full of surprises. Their adventures continue as a new power arises to threaten the world. The heart of creation is under attack, and time is definitely not on their side, as they battle against their enemies' undead hordes. Can they unlock the hidden power that can defeat him, or will his forces draw first blood? Get all three installments in the series. Book Zero, It's in the Blood. Book 1, Destroyer's Blood, and the new release, Book 2, First Blood, today. Available in ebook and paperback format on Amazon, Kobo, Apple, and most other fine e-tailers. Hello, this is Highway 59 recording artist Randy Moore, and you are listening to the Artist First Radio Network. Thanks for joining us on The Soul of the Everyman on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are podcasts. You can find them at artistfirst.com. Back to your hosts, Michael and Margaret Lines. Thank you very much, Seaman. I think that was a wonderful introduction. <laughs> <laughs> and tonight we are, we are talking about, um, in some ways, we're talking about thoughts and how 
you're, you know, uh, Tolley talks a lot about thoughts in one way, in, in the sense that he talks about the fact that that the pain body and that, that this sort of toxic, constant conversation in the head can become or can try to take over your awareness or, or block you from being, you know, in the moment of now, block you from a being and trying to make you into a, a, think, a thinking form or, or an emotion form. And uh, when we went to look for, um, you know, sort of quotes on this sort of a topic, this, you know, about thoughts, uh, there were a number of them. There was Deepak Chopra, and there was um, the, the quote that we put up was from uh, Amit Ray, and what he said there was, "You are not your thoughts, but you are the you are the observer of your thoughts." And and I liked that, the directness of that, because, you know, to spin off a little bit into into quantum theory, there is always the requirement for to coalesce reality out of that which is not yet to be mm-hmm. from 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 potential mm-hmm. so for every moment and the moments get very very small for for every moment from moment to moment you coalesce potential into that which has happened the past that coalescence requires one thing an observer and so in one way your mind which a lot of research recently, within the last several years, has, has started to think about the mind in a much different way and conscious, consciousness in a much different way. The mind um, has been, you know, where is, where is your consciousness? It's, it seems that the mind may be, in essence, a quantum effect machine that synapses and, in fact, the, the interactions of the neurons from one to the other has a quantum mechanical component. So the, the, the mind, in essence, interacts with a quantum field, some sort of quantum field. Consciousness may be born of that. It's hard to say that it is or it isn't, but, but it, it sounds and feels correct in many ways. Well, and it, it, it sounds like that the consciousness is, that's the interface, the physical interface. It, exactly. The mind is just an interface with consciousness. It's not born of consciousness. And that your thoughts require observation in order to, to, to speak to you, but in, in order to, in essence, become anything, to become an intelligible form, it must be observed. So the form, is another way to put it, is the form needs a stage. It needs an audience, or it cannot, in essence, in one way, be. But, but forms don't actually, they aren't beings, but but they don't exist. They don't coalesce. They don't become anything which can be um, sensed or perceived in any way, unless there is an observer. Because what does the sense think? What? Who does the perceiving? Who is the observer? It's all you. Really you. The real you. Well, if you think of thoughts as a processing point for the consciousness, for your physical body, because your body has got to exist in this world, in this moment, and its surroundings. So your thoughts um, are there to help let you know if there's danger, if there's something good to eat, if there's whatever is around you, making you aware of it. And I believe um, just from that alone, you can see how it would all develop into whether you liked what you were perceiving or not. Uh, And then contemplating or even beginning to plan ahead. In other words, this was a good fishing spot. I'm going to have to remember this particular spot. When I come back this time of year or when they use the stars to figure out when a date was um, and you could see all that as a tool uh, to help this body survive mm-hmm. and not just your body but if you're your group family or uh, the society you're living in uh, and that all 
develops, matures, and this is how we've suddenly become more dependent on the thought patterns because the society itself has become so complex and um, not enough time, I'd say, to be able to come back to that pure consciousness point because the mind, the thought, the thoughts, and the ego want to let you know what's going on around you. And the ego has an opinion of whether it likes it or not. So it's a very interesting interaction field that's going on. But mm-hmm. when you realize that uh, that you are more than your thoughts, because you can start drowning in all that. Mm-hmm. It can be on 24-7 to the point where you, you're so confused or overwhelmed. It's worse than I can't think anymore. It's I can't be anymore. Right. Uh, well, I like what you, you started with. You, know, you can see where the mind and thoughts and emotions are are a necessary sort of survival tool and and a very a very good one in that and, and and if you are living close to the bone if you are living in survival conditions where your thoughts are the difference between you living and dying where where knowing what to do and when to do it is extremely important for your continued survival moment to moment in that way thoughts have their place and and I think in in earlier, let's say, societies that live closer to nature, more uh, dependent on the seasons, more dependent on crops and whether they failed or they didn't, what you would have is a, um, a visceral connection to the external world from the point of view of being in it. You, you, you know, you had your place in that world, you had to do certain things, but you were connected to it. You, you, your world and you were in harmony in that sense. The world was, was a dangerous, but yet a, a place where you could, with your thoughts and with your actions, survive in it. Then, you know, if you get, you follow the, those logical thoughts and they become, um, you know, into technology, into, you, you start to push back the boundaries of what is required for survival. And thoughts now have a chance to kind of spin themselves up into all kinds of things. Well, that's resulted over at least tens of thousands of years, if not longer, in a very complicated and extremely comfortable world as far as the physical is concerned. But yet, you're right. Now, in essence, today, we drown in our thoughts. We, we have constant 24-7 talking in the head of not only your own thoughts, but the thoughts of others. You can have other voices in your head. Mm. It sounds like you're nuts, but you're not really nuts. You're, you're, you've taken in too much and allowed too many fragments, too many entities, too many forms have taken up residence, in truth, residence within your consciousness. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a certain um, hunger or need that the consciousness has to just be. And you see that now manifested in people in their in their um you know sort of an unexpressed desire to disconnect to get away from it all to uh, you know forest bathing or retreats of whatever time and 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 an interest in the exploring the being state because i think at this point the cacophony becomes tiresome and, and Tolia has said this too, Margaret, that, you know, you, you follow thoughts to their ultimate end and you find that they are empty mm. and, and that they lack a true um, reflection of being. And you find the end of thought and realize that you are outside of it that, and part of it is becoming the observer of your thoughts. And that leads you in, back into consciousness and puts thoughts back in their place. But it is a journey, you know, and, and there's... There's huge amounts of, especially in the modern world, huge amounts of um, 
energy on the side of distraction. Mm-hmm. Well, again, we said that certain forms just need attention to be able to persist in a con- some sort of conscious state. It has to feed off the consciousness in order to be. And when you realize that, because people, they, they complain that I can't turn my thoughts off. I'm, uh, you know, I'm exhausted. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's like, well, you are in charge of you. You have to make that decision. You have to take it back. Your consciousness is yours. Thoughts may demand it, but it's not theirs. Your consciousness is yours. Thoughts are part of the form that was created here. It's almost like, you know, your some article of clothing that you may have made and it's demanding to be worn. Yes. And yes. when you put it on, you're the you know, we've seen this before where people are like, Okay, I, I look beautiful in this and it's mistaking that that article of clothing that's draped on your body is you. Mm. It's not you. You could take it off. <laughs> right. And and thoughts, um, as as uh, Amit Ray says here, you're not your thoughts. And Tolly says the same, and many others have said, have said the same. Thoughts, thoughts tell you all the time that you are your thoughts. And people even get very confused about that. Well, how can I not be my thoughts? They're me. It, it, because it sounds like you. In your head, your thoughts sound like you. They speak in your voice. But again, if you just turn that around, we started this with the premise, who's listening? Who mm-hmm. hears your voice? You know, voices, you know, what's the sound of one hand clapping as the Cohen goes? Voices need to be heard in order to really to exist. So when, uh, when your thoughts speak, it, it, you know, uh, the, the Buddhist meditation to see a thought as a marble rolling on a table and it just drops off the table. That's, that's one way of thinking. But you, you could also think of it as, as Margaret said, as some sort of a little being popping up and, and it wants, it's trying to talk. And one thing I did, and this was the other day when, I was, when this came up to me, I said, well, let, let me see if I can just make the thought um, quieter. And I'll, I'll imagine that the thought is getting farther and farther away, and it got quieter and quieter, and finally it got far enough away that so I can barely hear that thought. <laughs> you, can, you, you, you can expand the room. So instead of a thought standing on the floorboards right next to you with its lips in your ear yelling, <laughs> you, can, you can tell it to stand in the corner and walk away, and it's in another part of the room, and you turn the, the, the faucet on, and you're like, you know, I can barely hear you. <laughs> and mm. it, and you can, you can, you can make your thoughts. You can, what the Buddhists say, quiet your thoughts. You can quiet them by kind of telling them, you know, sit down, shut up, speak in a lower tone of voice, speak when you're spoken to. You can discipline them in in many ways, like a like a wayward or or an unruly uh, child. The attitude of um, the Buddhist meditation is that thoughts come and go. Right? You, you are strictly to observe them. You don't need to interact with them. But they come into the space and then you let them go. And that's the, the disciplined act. You do not engage in them. When the thought comes and your consciousness reaches out mental fingers to look at that thought or examine it, that's when you engage. But the idea is as the observer, it rises up, you see it, but then it dissipates like mist. So pure observation, no interaction. That's the discipline that they teach. Like Caesar Milan. No touch, no talk, no eye contact. <laughs> pretty, nope. 
don't interact with your thoughts. <laughs> but it's not engaging, and the animals are a beautiful example mm-hmm. of that. Yes. Okay, so when when you have a dog or a cat coming at you and wanting attention, you give it no space, and they have to surrender to that moment because they know they're not in control. If they keep insisting, it's again, your consciousness has to establish itself as, I am Alpha. Mm, There you go. I decide what's in this space. And and it happens non-verbally. If you understand that whole thing, it can be just a simple body movement. If you watch... Um, the animals, the dogs, you can see who's the dominant one, the alpha. And everyone else understands that you have a certain amount of space around each and every one of them. That is the respect of the pack. Yeah, this is a wonderful analogy because the energy that he shows people how to use, you could use on your thoughts. You could treat your thoughts like a bunch of unruly dogs. Right now they're pulling and they're jumping and they're barking. And if you are alpha, you project that calm, assertive energy and your thoughts will literally come to heal. Mm -hmm. They'll walk with you. They'll be quiet and obedient. And yes, you can pay attention to them. You don't have to ignore them forever. You can say, oh, yes, what a great thought you are and pet it and give it a treat. And then say, go lie down in the corner and I'll come back in a little while. I'm going to go be now. As alpha, I'm going to be alpha. Alphas are the energy of the alpha is the energy of the whole pack. The pack responds to that. All your thoughts are like a bunch of <laughs> wild dogs or puppies. You know, they just have no discipline. They want burp, burp, burp. they want they want your attention instantly, and they think that every one of them is just as is more important than you are. Alpha says, "No, I'm alpha." You are to my side, behind me. You will respond to my energy, not the other way around. Mm-hmm. It's a great analogy. Mm-hmm. You can uh, do that with your own energy, absolutely. So the wayward parts of you that want to um, interrupt, because Alpha also sets the tone and the task. So if you are involved in a tone and a task and this thought arises, it has to, as you said, heal and wait until you are done with the task or you require it for something else. It's an internal discipline that you yourself must claim. Mm. Because no, nothing else can do this. None of these thoughts are capable of doing what you can do as consciousness, as alpha. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, Caesar says that too. I mean, this, is, I, this may be overusing. He says, claim your space. It's your, he says, your home. But it's your space, your mind, your being space within which the thoughts are yipping and yapping and barking and growling. Is your space. If you're alpha, they come to heal. They exist in your space as you allow them to exist. They do what you ask them to do. Thoughts are great. You want to run a thought off and tell it, go figure that out and analyze that and come back with the answer and I'll let you, when you're ready, let me know and then I'll give you some attention. Thoughts are like, yeah, this is great. But to have a yipping, barking, needy um, thought that is nothing but but distracting and not allowing you to you to be to be in peace to hold the peace energy right. is is no way to live. Claim that space. Claim your being space, and your thoughts will respect you. <laughs> in essence, well, they need their appropriate place. Maybe that's the best way to explain it. Everything needs its appropriate place when it, within a field of energy. Mm. And everything has an appropriate place. But 
if alpha is not paying attention, in other words, allowing for the space or gently organizing it, it's not a mental organization, but an energetic one. Yes. Um, then that's when you have to realize you need time to come back to you so that you can be that alpha, can be that primary consciousness that drives your being state and drives your life. And then your thoughts will be, in essence, happier to have alpha. Your thoughts really don't want to run you. They run you in the way that a that a beta dog or a, a, a immature dog runs a pack. It gets all frustrated and crazy and doesn't know what to do with itself. Well, it's not confident in the alpha. And I believe we've reached the end of our show. I think you're right. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm Michael Lyons. And I'm Margaret. And thank you for listening.